So I'm assuming everyone can hear and see the show okay. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this event. Uh, it's been really interesting for me to try and think about creating some relevance for you uh, around what I do. I've, I've titled the talk, Building for the Third Verb, and I promise you will know exactly what that means uh, by the time I'm finished uh, with a subtitle of cultural infrastructure and the promise of transformative change. Uh, my name is David Maggs. I am a fellow with the Metcalf Foundation in Toronto working on art and society uh, and have just recently left the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Germany where I was working on culture and climate change. Uh, so I very much sit in that intersection between cultural practices and the challenges of sustainability. Uh, my game code, most importantly, is nouns. Uh, somebody is cheeky in the game code assigning room, and <clears throat> my talk on verbs got the game code nouns, so you can use that. Uh, in thinking about trying to create some relevance uh, here between the worlds of culture and the worlds of buildings, which we're focused on, uh, today, I've, I've um, assumed that this talk primarily revolves around connections. Uh, the challenge of connecting sustainability's technical dimensions to its existential dimensions, uh, connecting the building aspects of the St. Lawrence Centre to what goes on inside, and hopefully connecting how I approach sustainability with the skills and interests of everybody here. Uh, I believe that you are mostly focused on the technical challenges of sustainability and, and my expertise lies at the intersection between sustainability and art uh, or climate change and cultural practices. Uh, so where you work on questions like how do we build the buildings that lead to a more sustainable world, I work on the question how do we build the meanings, uh, the identities, the values uh, that lead to a more sustainable world. And so the task of this talk is to explore where and how these questions intersect. And happily, this is also the task of the project as we ask ourselves, what is the sustainability impact of retrofitting the St. Lawrence Center for the Arts? How do we forge this connection? This issue remains uh, very much uh, up for discussion for me. Uh, I don't have a clear and concise set of answers to that question. It's something that I'm looking forward to exploring today. My goal is to set the context for that discussion by thinking about the relationship between art and sustainability challenges. And then my former mentor and, and uh, a man you heard from yesterday, John Robinson, it will join us in discussion as we take this, uh, this up in conversation with everybody following some opening remarks. So in speaking with uh, Leslie Lester and former TO Live Chair Robert Foster, John and I came up with a fairly ambitious question about this project. Can high performance sustainable cultural infrastructure interact with cultural programming in ways that generate a transformational ripple effect across the city of Toronto? Now, while the worlds of making buildings and making art may seem very far apart from each other, the reason that we believe this ripple effect is possible is not in spite of how different these elements are, but because of that difference, along with the unique potential that reconciling that difference presents to us in this project. As we explore this unique potential, I'm going to propose three basic virtues for us to keep in mind today transformation, performance, and engagement. I don't know whether to call these goals or features or design principles. I imagine them as both inputs and outputs, values that we take into the project, perhaps manifesting as outcomes on the way out. By transformation, I mean a proof of possibility that we can turn this ship before it is too late, that buildings and cities can shift from harming the planet to healing the planet. And John introduced his work on regenerative sustainability to you yesterday, so I know you're already steeped in this idea. Life can turn from something we are convinced is going to get inevitably worse to something full of community purpose and meaning. And we have the agency for that difference. We can uh, shift from one way of thinking about this and approaching this to a very different way. Performance uh, is what humans do to explore possibilities. So athletes exploring what a body can do 
artists exploring what a soul can feel. Uh, we learn, we become ourselves, we change our expectations, we generate possibility through performance. Now, this is obvious for somebody in sport or performing arts, but what about a building? Can a building become a performer? Can it function as an interactive and dynamic storyteller that presents the city with a tangible performance of transformation? And finally, engagement. This is how we connect the city to that story of possibility. Where does that happen? When in the process does that happen? For whom, how, and why? Uh, typically, sustainability puts this idea last. We establish the facts of the natural environment, we figure out the sustainability implications, and then we engage in pursuit of a form of compliance. But what if engagement sits at the beginning of the process alongside these virtues of transformation and performance? How does that adjust what it means for us to do this project right? So the idea behind STLC Next is that these values of transformation, performance, and engagement have a unique opportunity at the intersection of art and sustainability, an opportunity that doesn't exist if we are retrofitting an office tower. And this opportunity is built around the connection between the current state of our sustainability challenges and the unique power of the arts. So here I offer you the image of a violin. Now, on a violin, a string vibrates when you pull a bow across it, but we wouldn't hear that sound at all if it wasn't for the hollow wooden box, which that string is attached to in some very precise ways. So here, can we think about the building as our vibrating string and the activity that it hosts and incubates as that hollow box resonating that vibration across the city? What we need to figure out is how we make that point of intersection. How do we connect these two things? How do we nurture these connections between building making and meaning making? So I wanna explore these questions through three basic ideas or areas of discussion for today. Uh, first, transformation and ap amplification in cultural infrastructure. So what is unique about cultural infrastructure that it can become this violin of sustainability? The art shape whole in sustainability. So what is it about sustainability that is in need of the power of the arts right now? And finally, the transformative capacity of art. So what is it about art that sustainability requires in order to move beyond its present circumstance? So I heard a story anecdotally a while ago, uh, and it's been a little bit tricky for me to fully verify it. I'm gonna speak about it as if it is historical fact, but there may be uh, an element of conjecture here. Uh, and if somebody knows the details of the story, I'd be happy to hear that uh, after the talk. Uh, it's the story of trying to introduce indoor plumbing into buildings in the 19th century and the trouble with people's suspicions about the technology. The idea of doing your business indoors made people uncomfortable. This, of course, seems odd to us now, but if any of you have used an outhouse before, you can imagine that the thought of bringing that smelly mess inside your house would have seemed like a ridiculous idea, which makes this example so rich for us to think about because it isn't just a change in technology, it's about a change in sensibility. They couldn't imagine doing it and we can't imagine not doing it. That is transformation. Before it happens, we can't conceive of it, Afterwards, we can't imagine its absence. That's the nature of the change that we're looking for in sustainability. It has to be inconceivable enough now in order to make now seem inconceivable. And sustainability is precisely that kind of challenge. Inconceivable enough to our currently unsustainable world so that our unsustainable world becomes inconceivable to what follows. How do we do that? In the case of indoor toilets, what did they do? How did they overcome this gap between technology and sensibility? My understanding is they put it in hotels. They used infrastructure with a fluid population to create low commitment encounters. Nobody demanded people become immediately different. They created opportunities to explore that difference instead. In other words, a lot of different people got to perform the role. This is one reason STLC Next is so compelling as an instrument of sustainability. If we were to do this in an office tower, the same 300 employees cycle in and out of the building Monday to Friday. But if we do this in cultural infrastructure, we can cycle through the whole city as very diverse programming plays host to diverse audiences. 
And while this element of amplification is critical to the sustainability potential of this project, it doesn't dig deeper into that challenge of transformation on its own. For that, we have to go on a more perilous journey. We have to travel down a path that is both poorly marked and only barely visible on the landscape. The logic of transformative change requires nothing less. If the path is clear and the destination is known, then the one thing we can be sure of is that it will not lead us out of the unsustainable world. And this is the basic principle of any good story. This is the famous hero's journey. We never watch the hero take the journey that they want to take or the journey where they know where they are going or the journey they feel ready to set out on. If it is a journey we are able to take before setting out, then it is not a transformative journey. It will not change us as a result of going. So how do we find this unmarked path? How do we spot it in the landscape and then take up our journey of transformation? Here, I find it helpful to notice that over decades of activity, sustainability has been a two verb effort. What do we need to know and what do we need to do? The eternal hope of our civilization, and I would say the pathological ideology that we cannot seem to shake, is our exact equivalent of that Easter Islander building bigger and bigger statues to save them from an ecological collapse exacerbated, of course, by building bigger and bigger statues. It is the faith that the path of knowing better leads to the path of doing better. Unfortunately, the knowledge action model does not lead to transformative change. Research tracking the conversion of new information into new behaviors re reveals a persistent disconnect here, what we often refer to as the infamous knowledge action gap. Part of the reason that STLC Next is so exciting, of course, is because it offers a very practical opportunity to do something different. Instead of trying to squeeze knowledge into action, we can invite a new verb into our sustainability challenges. So if science has been pursuing sustainability as the things we need to know and policy in terms of the things we need to do, the cultural focus of STLC Next can reposition our approach to sustainability in terms of what to be it gives us a chance to activate an entirely new verb. Now, before we think about this question of being as it relates to sustainability, I wanted to stop for a second and just explore this very strange verb with you for a moment. If we conjugate the verb run, we get I run, you run, she runs, we will run, they ran. So there's not a lot of variety here, right? Run, runs, ran. But if we conjugate to be, we get I am, you are, she is, we will be, they were, he was. So we have be, am, are, is, were. It's The word itself is a shape shifter. It doesn't even feel like the same word from one conjugation to the next. It is, I am told by Googling it, our most irregular verb, the verb that changes the most in relationship to its subject. It's also an auxiliary verb. So if I say, she wept, you aren't waiting around for me to finish the question, uh, the sentence. But if I say, she is, you have an expectant look on your face. She is what? This shape-shifting helper verb isn't one that we usually pay much explicit attention to on its own. We love talking about eating better, thinking clearly, running faster, swimming further, singing louder, chewing quietly. But being isn't something that we consider explicitly. It took, of course, the extremely talkative and introspective character, uh, <clears throat> uh, the most um, verbose character in literature, to come up with the most famous line about this. But even he, at the end of that play, arrives at a fairly passive conclusion about how to relate to this question of being. So I just wanted to, to put that in place to let you know we are in, in, invariably going into some slippery terrain here, and I don't want anybody to feel bad if they find this slightly disorienting. This is not a place where the mind goes in any sort of natural way. But we can see why this matters if we think back to those toilets and sensibilities and the challenge that sustainability puts before us. We don't need change here, we need transformative change. And we can feel the difference between these two if we ask ourselves, look, if something has transformed, what has happened to it? Has it learned something different? Has it done something different? Or has it become something different? Transformative change is not changing what we know or what we do, 
It is changing what we are. It is plainly enough a question of being. Unfold the language like this and the absence of this verb suddenly seems quite problematic in terms of sustainability. We've been pursuing this problem down the wrong path. We've been tackling a being problem with only the verbs knowing and doing. And it's a rather pitiful image that we're here desperately wandering around all these well-worn paths, hoping that somehow someday they're gonna lead us somewhere new. And I'm sure you all know that handy definition of insanity. We've been working on this problem within a paradigm of relative futility. So we can feel this futility and fairly stark disconnect uh, that shows up between effort and progress marking the past decade, where we've seen huge increases in sustainability activity across fields like science, policy, technology, law, finance, and elsewhere, and yet all yielding minimal progress. To use a recent metaphor, we are stuck playing three-dimensional uh, chess using a two-dimensional board, a game requiring three planes of activity where we have only learned to move around on two of them. So if sustainability involves knowing, doing, and being, and our society has little clarity or capacity in how to play in this third plane, it shouldn't surprise us that we're getting soundly beaten in a dimension that we barely perceive. We are like a baseball team that can hit and throw, but can't catch, or we're hockey players that can shoot and pass, but haven't learned how to skate. No matter how good we are at these other two aspects, we will never win. So how do we learn how to catch? How do we learn how to skate? How do we open up that third dimension on our chessboard? How do we find the hidden pathway and add this third verb to how we work on sustainability challenges? What does it mean to work at the level of being? If we aren't trying to change what we know and we, uh, or we aren't trying to change what we do, we are trying to change what we are, but what exactly does that mean? If we remember the toilets again, we're trying to change something about ourselves that seems inconceivable now, but that makes now inconceivable once that change has occurred. That's the condition we need to learn how to cultivate. And if we can't, we will continue to lose at this game of three-dimensional chess. We will remain stuck in our knowledge action paradigm, and we will wander well-worn paths leading to all the places we already know how to find and none of the places we actually need to get to. So as obscure as these ideas might seem, as weird as it is to try and talk about being, if we want to avoid the futility of status quo approaches to sustainability engagement, we have to understand what being is and how it relates to problems like climate change. So first, let's just ask, what is being? How are we thinking about this word? Uh, I think things get a little more concrete for us if we take the idea of being and we break it down into elements of identity, meaning, value, belief, purpose, and our underlying sense of time and place, self and world. And we can seek even greater clarity by going on, going beyond just trying to say what these things are uh, and to notice what they do. So this is not the part of ourselves that is shaped by the information that we receive but it is the part of ourselves that is doing the shaping of that information. It determines what we see, what we pay attention to, what sounds true, what strikes us as right and good, and what we dismiss, ignore, or find unthinkable, like indoor toilets for 19th century being, or outdoor toilets for 21st century being. Humans inhabit their sense of being the way an astronaut inhabits their spacesuit. Changing our being here in the middle of our lives needs to be understood as difficult as changing spacesuits in the middle of our spacewalk. It is existential peril. Were it not, there is nothing transformative at stake. So this is the rock and the hard place that we find ourselves in. In one sense, we realize how futile our traditional approaches to sustainability have been, but then we are left asking, well, how on earth do we go about doing this? Recently, I've been doing a lot of work on art and climate and working with one of Canada's leading climate artists, Kendra Fanconi. And she always begins the workshops that we're doing with a very simple exercise. She says, take a moment to think about an encounter with art that changed you. A novel that you read, a painting that you stood in front of, a play that you watched, an album that came out, a film that you saw, where the world became a different place or you became a different person as a result of some incredible artistic experience. And what we found is that everyone has an answer to this question. 
Nobody looks at us and says, what are you talking about? It seems we can all name encounters with art that we describe to ourselves as transformative, where something engaged us at that level of being and where art provided the symbolic infrastructure to lift us out of one spacesuit and place us in another, where it led us down a pathway we hadn't noticed before to a place we had never been. That is how we need to think about what art is, the symbolic infrastructure of being. The trouble is, while we can all name the moment that art has done something transformative to us, we then assume that we can do something transformative with art. And when we do, the results are often disillusioning. We write songs about saving fish, we create images for carpooling, we build theater to explain conservation mandates. And instead of moving beyond the typical two verb effort of sustainability, these efforts typically slump back into a knowledge action framework. So just when we need it most, art abandons the critical task of opening up that third dimension, activating that third verb and initiating that journey of transformation. Why are we so able to recall the transformative power of art, the moment that art has reached us at that level of being, but then when we try and use that power, we fall back into the knowledge action paradigm? What is happening when we go from a descriptive certainty to a prescriptive effort, when we try and convert what art did do for me into what art will do for others? Here, almost always without noticing, our efforts to apply the social agency of art find themselves trying to replicate effects rather than processes. We end up trying to reproduce what art does rather than understand and replicate how art works. So we squander the opportunity to carry sustainability beyond its two verb effort into that third dimension on our chessboard, down that unmarked path and into the realm of being. Now we can avoid this with a more concise account of what art is. So it's very tempting to think about art in terms of its expressive capacity, but this is the account that leads to an instrumental relationship with art where we turn it into a tool for knowing things. It is more helpful to understand our relationship to the aesthetic and our approach to art making in terms of attention. Art is the capacity to pay attention to the world in terms of the aesthetic. It is an ability to pay, pay attention to ourselves and our world, not in terms of concepts and ideas or analyses and explanations, but in terms of lines and shapes, rhythms, harmonies, imagery, metaphor, texture, pattern, color, size, scale, etc. So more than a unique power of expression, art is a unique power of attention. More than an ability to say something in the world, it is the ability to hear something. And this is how art opens that new possibility of being. It is how it begins to build the symbolic infrastructure of the worlds beyond this one. Turning back to STLC next then, and how we fulfill the promise of this project, I find it helpful to explore the way this relationship between art and sustainability typically shows up in practice. And so to do so, I'd like to divide the interactions between art and sustainability into three distinct modes. Mode one, I call greening the sector. This is the most familiar form of this relationship. It involves understanding carbon footprints associated with our activities and our venues, and then exploring ways to reduce that footprint. So it's a lot of the technical dimensions in which you are also proficient here. In mode one, sustainability hinges on what people do. Mode two, I refer to as raising the profile. And this is the approach that sits inside that knowledge action framework that is lured into believing that if we knew better, we would do better. And the task for us is to raise awareness, communicate the science and get the information out there. Here, the challenge hinges on what people know. Finally, mode three, which is obviously my favorite mode, uh, what I refer to as reauthoring the world. And here, the relationship between art and climate appeals to that transformative power of art that we all identified for ourselves a moment ago, where art can change the way we imagine ourselves, each other, and the world around us. Here, the challenge hinges on not what we do or what we know, but what we are. It's that relationship between art and being that we want to learn to activate inside sustainability challenges. 
So mode one is all the very impressive work that's happening here, shifting buildings towards net positive on an increasing array of dazzling indicators. What we heard yesterday from John is that these mode one aspects are only a subset of building performance, however, requiring shifted sensibilities either to activate or complement these advances. What we're exploring today is what that shift entails and how we do it, arriving at this priority of being and the role of art and aesthetics, culture and design. How do we understand, relate to and build for that third verb? Or in the terms of these three modes, how do we move our sustainability engagements from mode two to mode three? If we go back to those three values that we started with, transformation, performance and engagement, we can only do performance and engagement inside mode two. To work at that level of being, we have to be working in mode three. What we see over and over again, however, is that people describe the relationship between art and sustainability in terms of mode three, but then they practice in terms of mode two. We describe our relationship to art in terms of being, but then we only manage to apply it at the level of knowing. And so I created a table to try and help distinguish these two modes from one another and draw a bit of a line in the sand so that when we do step into practice, we've got a better sense of the difference between doing one versus the other. So if there's mode two is a focus on knowing and mode three on being, in mode two, art is primarily a power of expression. And in mode three, we really pay attention to its power of attention. In mode two, typically political and social agendas are driving the process. In mode three, it's an aesthetic agenda, agenda that's driving the process. And then we can contrast all kinds of words that help us feel out the distinctions between these two ways of, of operating, inform versus inquire, teach versus learn, educate or explore, insist versus reveal, tell versus show, truth versus meaning, certainty versus po possibility. Uh, propaganda versus art, uh, and, and even particularly in the, in the art and climate circumstance, pushing from the problem versus pulling towards the solution. So let's just review for a moment before closing and turning to discussion. We know that the change in sustainability requires transformative change, something that is inconceivable enough now to make now inconceivable. And this happens at the level of being. So the challenge of sustainability rests on our capacity to activate this third verb. The knowledge action paradigm cannot get us there. Arts and cultural practices can, providing we don't convert them back into tools of the knowledge action paradigm in some misguided effort to be useful. So we need to avoid mode two and operate in mode three. That is one of our best hopes for nurturing transformative change in intentional ways. Which means I hope that we are ready to return to that initial question that we started with. How do we connect this transformative capacity to what all of you do at a building systems level? How do we forge the intersections between mode one and mode three, between building infrastructure and symbolic infrastructure? And to inspire this point of discussion, I'm going to close with a final anecdote from the work of Kendra Fanconi, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, she's currently developing an outdoor theater piece on an area of land that needs to be cleared of its brush and brambles. And what the company used to do, and what most of us would do, is to bring in machinery that would clear the land and then begin developing climate theater. However, the company's commitment to mode one prevents the use of fossil fuels wherever alternatives exist. And so in this case, the only way to clear the land for this project is to use pigs. Now, suddenly a relationship to mode one shifts from a simple technical strategy to an aesthetic process in and of itself. Pigs clearing land in order to make room for climate theater is already climate theater. And so the question that we can ask ourselves for STLC next is, how do we make pigs out of all the cool things that you know how to do? How do the windows and water systems and energy and air quality innovations become performers? And when they do, how do they create the roles and the room for their co-stars, the artists and audiences that will move in and out of the space throughout the year? And this is where I see the point of intersection, that we must combine the technical with the dramaturgical at the very beginning. This is how our virtues of transformation, performance and engagement lay the foundations of this project. In addition to all the technical knowledge you bring to this development process, it needs dramaturgy. 
And this is just the process of story building. Can we engage with the technical systems as components of a play? What are the aesthetic properties that they contribute? What symbolic weight do they bring into the space? What dramatic tensions arise and resolve through their operations? And what meanings emerge from their functions and affordances? Building on the development of the Center for Interactive Research on Sustainability that John presented yesterday, I'm imagining an expanded form of the integrated design process that was so critical to that project. Uh, he and I were just chatting before we started the talk today, and he tells me that we're now steeped in something new, which is, I've written in here in ink, integrated project delivery. So I'm keen to pick up on whether that approach might take this idea of, of making story building and performance at, at the building level, uh, and particularly infusing it in the design process. Uh, even more consequential for how we move this project forward. But my idea here is that we need to have the right playwright in the room, someone who can interrogate what we're doing uh, at a technical level for its elements of character, drama, symbolism, and meaning, building with semiotics at the center of the process, not just what these technologies do, but what they signify. And if this strikes you as artsy and flaky, Consider that this is exactly what that Danish window company is doing when they're telling a story about healthy buildings in order to sell you windows. Take that basic idea that was, I guess, a PR strategy and make it pervasive in how we build. Humans cannot play their part in the sustainable world if we do not cast them in meaningful roles within a compelling story. This is the spacesuit. Without these elements, we are trying to launch people into outer space wearing shorts and t-shirts. We are not giving them the qualities of being that they need to survive out there. And 99% of sustainability efforts fail to do this because hardly any of our change infrastructure from consultants to governments to academia has any capacity to work at this level. And STLC next, it might if we can go about it in the right way. Thank you very much, and I look forward to chatting with you further on these questions. Jen, do you want me to stop sharing? Um, yeah, yeah and, and everyone can feel free to um, unmute if you want to turn your camera on to ask some questions. I'm going to unmute John. We have in a chat. David, thank you so much. The verb to be even is expressed with multiple words in many languages. In a city as multicultural, as multicultural, what are your thoughts of how we translate this concept to reimagining a space where inhabitants can experience being in the STLC? Yeah. You know, that that question is at the heart of cultural policy thinking in Toronto right now. Uh, and and indeed at a federal level as well. And the funny thing is that, you know, sort of the, the, it's it's our cultural practices that we've turned to the most to try and make sense of and narrate what it means to try and live in a world where there is no fundamental truth, fundamental value. There's no primary cultural identity. How do we operate and exist inside of world without that sort of fundamental signifier of what is true and right and good or what being means? Uh, and so I think, you know, I think what, what the cultural sector has been grappling with is how to do that at, or, at an organizational level, how to do that in terms of a funding and policy level. And I would imagine that that's one of the real opportunities that, that, that would be fairly unique about STLC Next is it can bridge all the work that the cultural sector has been doing to really foster cultural pluralism and what that means as a civic identity uh, and yet relate it back to some fairly hard technical dimensions around sustainability itself. David, can you see the chat? If you open the chat, no. can you can oh, yes. see the questions as they come okay. in. Okay. I have a big question. Yes, I think I'm going to see. Okay, that's good. That's good. Yeah, I, I mean that 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 example leapt out for me. Uh, in and I think it's what what usually happens is the pigs remain backstage. 
uh, you never see them. And 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 so with with Kendra's work and making Mode One such a fundamental commitment uh, inside her company, suddenly resolving these questions weren't simply sort of questions of means; they became the ends too. Uh, and so this field that's being prepared in this particular way is already starting to tell the story of the larger levels of identity that are that are taking place inside that project. And so it's, it was such an obvious one because it wasn't sort of one piece of technology swapped out for another. It was like, you know, instead of a big industrial mulcher, a bunch of pigs had taken up presence. So you immediately kind of ask a, a, a very particular question about it and starting to activate that kind of presence and make characters of these of these these changes, I think, is really where there's a huge potential for the integration between, you know, what I'm referring to as kind of mode one and mode three to be engaging with being. John, does that resonate with with some of the things you were talking about yesterday? Yeah, I, I like that metaphor a lot. Um, I think it it necessarily means not just a change from uh, the mulcher to the pig, but uh, in order to even conceive of that possibility, setting up processes of engagement and interaction uh, that are uh, allow these different ways of being uh, to emerge. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, intercultural uh, interaction of the kind that was suggested in the last question. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're talking about is pig making processes right. uh, in order. Otherwise, we just keep having technology. So we'll do triple pane instead of double pane glazing. But what if the the way we con we conceive of fenestration was pig like? How, how could it be pig like? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't think that can be imposed from outside. I think that really needs to merge from the design process itself. And that design process needs to involve a lot of people that weren't normally, aren't normally part of it. And one of the shifts from IDP, integrated design to IPD, integrated project delivery, that you heard about this morning is uh, that broadening of the group. I would add to what we heard about from Bill, uh, I would add the, the eventual inhabitants of the building and the building operators as part of the IPD. Uh, he didn't mention them, but I, I, I don't imagine he would object to that. Uh, and how do we create these conversations that just shift the whole frame of reference of what we're trying to do in the building? Um, and as I would argue, make things better for people and, and for nature. You know, every time you raise a, 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 a an, an argument like that, which I, I mean, I, I agree with it. I just also want to immediately follow up by putting the two uh, strong towns blogs in the chat. Uh, most public engagement is worthless, and most public engagement is worth worse than worthless um, because that you know you can sort of we run headlong into taking that idea on. Uh, and then you do it and it's ineffective and you're exhausted and it's made the project just seem impossible uh, rather than this thing that suddenly lifted the thing off the ground. And I think so much of it hinges on the points that those authors are making in those blogs. I agree. And this is the difference, isn't it, between mode two and mode three, right? A lot of the engagement we usually do is mode two engagement. Yeah. It's about conveying a message, educating people, communicating the science. Um, and that that that's not the way we need to design these processes mm -hmm. of engagement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jen, are there other questions or should we just keep rattling away here? You can rattle away. If, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, if anyone, please, uh, please put your question in the chat or unmute yeah. yourself, whatever you're comfortable well, with. Sure. In the meantime, and, and, and interrupt me, you know, but one of the things that, that I, I, I would just flag here is to say I spent the whole week preparing this talk, worrying about saying something that was just going to be like, you know, what is the point of raising this? Like, you sound like a philosopher that's trying to feel better about getting a PhD. And, and, and you know, this sort of in, it, like invariably obscure idea of trying to get people to talk about or think about being. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I, I raise it because John and I have been banging our heads against this wall for almost 20 years of trying to find the language that talks about stepping out of one world and into another. 
And we spent a decade saying ontology. And by the end of that decade, we had so few friends left that we had to somehow come up with new language for this. And so, you know, I'm trying out being here to see if that's the way that, that we need to be talking about this and trying to find the logic of really saying, you know, if we really think about what kind of change we're trying to produce here, and we look historically at those, those changes that have happened, the toilets one being, you know, one example, but there are lots of those sorts of things where there's a kind of inconceivable moment that then on the back end, the reverse becomes inconceivable. That's that, you know, trying to define the quality of change and then locate it somewhere and really be as specific as we can about saying, this isn't something that we knew, that we didn't know and we know now, or that we're suddenly doing differently. It's that we've really become a different kind of entity that can't even imagine doing the thing that we used to do. Uh, the one that we like to do in workshops all the time is you give people a, a chip bag or a piece of garbage and you take them outside and you ask them to drop it on the ground. <laughs> and you watch their bodies get all squirrely as you've tried to make them litter. And those are the sorts of things where you're trying, that's when you're activating that stuff, that sense of being is suddenly called to the surface at that point. Yet most people, when we do that, can remember a time when littering was, yeah, you know, I mean, you know, there's no garbage around, so it's okay for me to throw this on the ground. It's just that sort of thing that we're, we need to kind of call to the surface more effectively. I wonder if I can give two examples in the building, yeah, lighting a cigarette inside, right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, two examples in the kind of building sector, one that hasn't happened yet, but one that has happened. Um, and... <clears throat> Uh, the one that, it, well, maybe they both haven't yet happened, but when we build a building, uh, there's a process at the end uh, uh, of the design process, uh, of the construction process, well, design and construction, um, that is called value engineering. And that's when uh, suddenly the budget crunch happens and you got to cut. And every project goes through this uh, and has to deal with value engineering. Uh, and what gets cut is the question. And the thought experiment I always like to think of is nobody says, ah, labor code. We can't do the labor, too expensive. Right? Just let's cut out the labor you know, code requirements. Or health and safety. You know, can't do health and safety, too expensive. Um, because they've been normalized and it's inconceivable. It's a now inconceivable thing to not do those things. Um, in the past, as we all know from the famous photograph of the high-rise iron workers sitting on this you know, way above the city with no straps, no safety gear, et cetera. That was, it was probably inconceivable that those codes would be uh, just part of what we do. So there's that switch. Mm -hmm. Sustainability hasn't become the labor code yet, but that's what we need is for all of the sustainability stuff to be absolutely uh, just what you have to do. It's not, you can't not do it. You have many different ways of doing it, but you've got to do it. How do we get to that? Uh, it, new, uh, uh, formerly inconceivable, now uh, inconceivable without. Um, so I think we can uh, imagine, and the second one I'll mention is running the building. Who's in charge of the building? Well, we hire building operators and they run the building. Could we imagine a process where the inhabitants of the building are actually deeply engaged in interacting with the building operators so they can actually get a vote on heating and cooling how do we even do that? None of the existing systems work for that purpose. And when you talk to building operators, they run screaming from the room at the very thought of dealing with hundreds of fractious inhabitants telling them, you know, the temperature should be up in my workspace. But could we imagine uh, a process where those kinds of interactions become the norm? It becomes, we learn how to do that. We learn how to reconcile everybody's comfort and, and experience goals with uh, the building goals. Uh, so those would be two examples, it seemed to me, that sort of speak to this uh, inconceivable now and now inconceivable distinction that you were mm -hmm. making. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you think they work for that. Yeah, the, you know, I was, I, was, I was interested in that when you were showing the lights and the voting um, aspirations of some of these building things and wondering what is the difference between kind of big aggregate decision making versus it is sort of direct democracy, like putting your head out the window and or putting your head down the hallway and shouting for somebody to turn the temperature up, and the, and and particularly as that swings over into a lot of the the well-being 
uh, aspects, like getting along with your neighbors? Um, does it make a more contentious workspace? Right, or does it actually take you closer to where you want to go? I mean, the the mode two view would be it might be more contentious, but the mode three view might be a little different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The you know one of the things that that I suppose we've sort of waited to really start to dig in on is the question of how much we can. The question you were wanting to float to Clyde, uh, who's the head of TO Live. Um, around the, the amount of interactivity uh, that's possible between users. You know, how, how would you bring the users of STLC Next to the table and who are they? And this gets into a, a, a fairly, you know, sort of a, a kind of political and logistical problem of who, who, who's been using that building up to now? What have they been using it for? And what's their projected use profile going forward? And is that what we want to preserve? as this becomes cultural infrastructure, particularly in light of that first question around wanting to be reflective of a much more multicultural reality of Toronto, whereas this has largely been dominated by Western Eurocentric cultural practices. And that's what this building was designed to be. I don't know how that, I mean, that's a TO Live City of Toronto question to try and sort out. But I think it, one thing that would be, would be smart to do would be to carry some proposal uh, around that issue, re particularly relevant to sustainability performance, you know, pulling the kind of uh, the human indicators of net positive forward as part of trying to animate this conversation around pluralism, because this is going to be a problem for for SDLC next as they are trying to figure out who their masters are that they need to answer to. And users are going to be a big problem there because they've got people who feel fairly entrenched. But if you look at the use profile, 10 years ago, some of those users were using the building 100 nights a year. Now they're down to two and three weeks because the level of live performance uptake has been so low. I wonder if we could engage in the, in the spirit of broadening the integrated project delivery beyond the designers and builders and cost estimators and so on into the inhabitants, into the, the performing arts companies that would be using the building as well as TO Live itself and start to create a collective process of creating the narrative about STLC next. What is, what is it, you know, mm -hmm. the being question, mm -hmm. what is STLC next? And who should be involved in that conversation? Because I suspect right now it's only the uh, TO Live and the prefer, you know, maybe some of their clients and and some of the people that use the building, uh, and all of the people in this room now, all of the designers and technical people, building science people, are not part of that discussion. Mm -hmm. But maybe mm -hmm. we should actually start thinking about creating a, a more inclusive narrative of of what this project is it's not just a we, build we have another question in the chat too mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. rebecca jacob great could engage with brought to a new level of incorporation yeah i think i was almost like that question was kind of where you were going john in terms of expanding well the I, idp to ipd and shifting the, the the you know all of the different voices that are at the table uh, in terms of that. And, and then, you know, this ha asks an interesting question about not just who's at the table, but what are the means by which we're activating those kinds of voices? Do we want to be starting with technical trade-offs? Do we want to be starting with um, a sort of, you know, kind of a rational analysis of who's in the room, what's possible, all those sorts of things, but actually starting with the aesthetic as a way of beginning to imagine what we want right. this building right. to be. Could we think maybe of the final line that I would just put in quickly there would be the difference between doing that, like R Rebecca, I'm, I, I love the instinct in there, it, you know, and all I would say is put a watchword on that process to make sure that what you're not doing is trying to use art as a tool to bring you to some particular design vision or to come, come up with what's often done, kind of compliance around decisions that are already made, but that really what you're doing first is giving people a, a, the, the, the invitation to, to imagine, to pay attention to possibility in terms of the aesthetic rather than using the aesthetic as a way of trying to hinge some sort of larger agenda. So what this makes me think of, Rebecca, is when you say incorporating art in the process itself, could we think of STLC 
next as art, the whole process as a piece of art or a, a process of art and the building as an artistic statement. So it's, it's an incarnation and an instantiation at one point in time, the next 10 years or so, of all of these ideas. That's what, it, that, that will be literally put into concrete and steel and wood and so on. So it is itself a piece of art uh, and the process of creating it and then of using it is an artistic process. I think David, that's kind of what you're suggesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's how I, I'm, I'm trying to riff uh, Rebecca on what you were saying there. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think that's been particularly expressed uh, so far. I think there is openness maybe to that idea, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, what's the difference between that and, and trying to think about the building as storytellers? Is there something more that you're right. reaching for there, John? Right. Yeah, it's, I mean, we know building as pedagogy. There's a whole literature about that and we should yeah. really pay attention to that. Yeah. Um, but it's not just uh, pedagogy in the sense of, you know, speaking truth to power or communicating the answer. It's pedagogy in the sense of evolving and changing and transforming itself. Right. So the building over time might actually fundamentally change its identity. But we yeah. got some more questions here we should okay. take a look at. Um, story of this reimagining would be so Yeah, storytelling. Yeah, uh, okay. yeah. Uh, I just had a, a point to uh, ask if, we were discussing right now about who were the right people who were, invited to the table when we were discussing, we also discussed about the art companies who are going to use it for the maximum amount of time, right? Uh, so I just had to um, ask one perspective, like uh, I remember somebody mentioned in the sessions that, you know, uh, they did community surveys and people were invited, uh, you know, given a brief amount of time to respond uh, to uh, how the things they want in their neighborhood or so and through. So do you think it was, it was a platform made available to them to reach out and, you know, uh, let, let, uh, STLC know that, you know, Hey, we need these things or being from these background, like we are going to use the facility and we would like, uh, certain elements if you're going to change it for the same. Yeah. John, do you want to go first on that? Yeah, I think a lot of those process, those processes are, are important to have but they often fall into the mode two and uh, mode one kind of uh, knowing and doing model. So they're saying, what do you know that we, we need to know when that's the engagement and what should we do? Uh, what should be done in these spaces? Uh, what would be nice is to broaden them into the being question as well. What, it, what is it? What, what's the identity, the meaning, the, the very being of what we're trying to do here? And just by asking that question, I think you'd get a different set of responses than simply, what do you want the building to have? How do you want to use it? You know, all those, those are all important questions. I think they should definitely be asked, but maybe it could go beyond that a little bit. And, and uh, uh, the, the point that I was just making on Car earlier about uh, the, these, these wonderful articles um, about public engagement being worthless and worse than worthless, uh, yeah, is, is, is really about structuring those processes so that you are actually engaging with the people you're talking to in the ways in which and the things about which they are experts uh, and not providing them with a whole bunch of information and expecting them to sort of meaningfully inform dimensions that they have no expertise in, which it strikes me as, as and I think, they, you know, they make this point in these articles as a sort of it's an exercise where you get faulty or lousy information, and you've also created levels of expectation that will produce mostly disappointment and resentment in the people that you've engaged with. Uh, neither John and I were involved in the discussions that happened with STLC Next beforehand, but in reading a lot of the kind of recommendations that came out of that process, Certainly, if I was the if I was leading that project, I would feel like that was an albatross hanging around my neck at that point, like just a, you know a huge burden where suddenly the project has been what this project needs to do is be perfectly good for all people at all times and respect you know entirely people's sense of privacy and be maximally open to whoever you just think 
how the heck could you ever create a development project that's going to satisfy that level of goal? And so it's 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 the way in which those processes are structured, where you're actually getting the right kind of information from relevant people, and it's able to fit into the project in a meaningful way. Yeah. Um, do, uh, I, uh, after about forty or fifty years of doing community engagement and participatory processes with citizens, um, it when I read those two articles David mentioned, it really struck me that having a public engagement process and asking people what kind of solar collector there should be in the building or how wastewater should be treated is just missing the whole point, right? Like that is not, you're, you get from, and I can testify to this, you get exactly the same answer in these processes time and time again. We want lots of renewables. We want lots of energy efficiency. We want all the kind of virtues. We want them all. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's because they're, it's the wrong question. Those aren't the questions about which people have authority and expertise and knowledge and uh, a major contribution. The, the, they're, in these two articles, they talk about what kind of, how it makes me feel to walk around my neighborhood. What kinds of features of the neighborhood would increase my sense of safety? Something that an expert may not know at all, but they know because it's their life. So can we turn the questions a little bit towards those more existential dimensions uh, about which they are the authority because it's them that, you know, the, the experience is relevant. Uh, so I don't know if this is taking us off a bit offline for the, the purpose of, of this week. Uh, on, on, a, on a similar note then, uh, like, like uh, since we are discussing this, uh, can uh, the parties who are going to be involved further in the designing of the process go ahead and undertake this task then in order to create more meaningful design? Like, what are your views on that one? Well, in principle, of course. In practice, it depends, you know, on their willingness and their mandate and their budget and all the practical constraints and so on. But you can certainly propose as part, I mean, what I hope out of this boot camp is some pretty radical suggestions will emerge that wouldn't have naturally emerged through a normal process because you guys are thinking outside the box a little bit. Um, and uh, you're, you know, you're not uh, paid by the hour to produce standard kinds of, of, of answers. Um, so uh, I, whether those recommendations will be followed <laughs> remains to be seen, but there's a lot of openness that I, I get. And uh, David, I don't know if your sense is the same, uh, but our meetings with the TO Live people have been incredibly positive. I, I think they're very interested in this. So I think the door is open for you all to to really, you know, make some suggestions that might not other 